Hi guys, it's Claire. Welcome back. So it has been a while and that's because July was an incredibly busy month for me. I was barely home. As some of you may know, I took a road trip at the start of the month to go see one of my friends in Wyoming. And then last week I was home in Wisconsin visiting my parents. So it's been a great month in a lot of ways, but it was also kind of a wash reading wise. But I did get to a handful of books that I wanted to talk about. And then I also thought I would throw in some of the very mediocre vlogging footage that I took while I was in Wyoming in case you're at all interested in that. So let's get into it. So my last video from a few weeks ago was a TBR for my Wyoming road trip in which I really had the best of intentions and carefully selected several thematically appropriate audiobooks and in the end I only ended up listening to two of them. But the first one was No No Boy by John Okada which was first published in 1957 and is one of the first Asian American novels to address the topic of Japanese internment during World War II. And this book was actually recommended to me by my friend Erin, who I was visiting, because she studies Japanese internment and has also been working at the Heart Mountain Interpretive Center this summer, which is the site of a Japanese internment camp just outside Cody, Wyoming. And the title of this novel comes from a term used to describe Japanese American men who were interned and who answered no to two statements on a government loyalty questionnaire that basically required them to serve in the U.S. military and pledge unqualified allegiance to the United States. And after refusing to declare their loyalty to the U.S., many of these young men were sent to federal prison, and this book centers around one such no-no boy named Ichiro. And interestingly, this novel opens right after Ichiro has been released from prison at the end of the war, so instead of directly exploring the internment experience or the condition of being unjustly imprisoned, this book really delves into the social and psychological aftermath of internment. So this book really explores all the anger and alienation that Ichiro feels as he tries to rebuild his sense of identity as an American who has been rejected by his country first through internment and then through the social ostracization he faces as someone who didn't serve in World War II. At the same time, he also doesn't feel a significant connection to his parents' homeland of Japan, and often his sense of rootlessness and aimlessness manifests as anger and resentment towards his parents, particularly his mother, and in that way the novel exposes some of the fractures within the Japanese American community. And although I wouldn't call this book a page-turner necessarily, and although the plot is sometimes aimless and meandering in a way that I guess echoes Ichiro's driftlessness, interspersed throughout the story are these intense and powerful internal monologues in which all of Ichiro's pain and frustration frustration kind of unravel as he wrestles with his sense of identity and his place within the world. One example of those comes after his mother tells him, you are my son, and he responds, one is not born in America and raised in America and taught in America, and one does not speak and swear and drink and smoke and play and fight and see and hear in America, among Americans in American streets and houses, without becoming American and loving it but I do not love enough, for you were still half my mother, and I was thereby still half Japanese, and when the war came and they told me to fight for America, I was not strong enough to fight you, and I was not strong enough to fight the bitterness which made the half of me, which was you, bigger than the half of me, which was America, and really the whole of me that I could not see or feel. I am not your son, and I am not Japanese, and I am not American. So it's passages like that that I think make this a worthwhile read, and if you're at all interested in Asian American literature, then I think this is a must-read book as a historical text and an early example of real outrage about Japanese internment and racism against Asian Americans, which are too often buried and ignored by history. And I should also mention that my friend Erin is a part of a really cool music group that performs songs inspired by Asian American experiences and Japanese internment in particular, and the name of their group is No No Boy. So if you're at all interested in what they do and want to check out some of their upcoming concerts, I'll link some of their songs and tour 
tour schedule down below. Then I listened to The Line Becomes a River, Dispatches from the Border by Francisco Cantu, which is his account of the time he spent as a Border Patrol agent in Arizona. And although I guess you could call this book a memoir, it's really more a series of loosely structured vignettes of his time on the border, the people and migrants that he met during that time, and the dreams that haunted him before and after the fact. And interwoven throughout it all is some of his own personal history as well as some history about the border itself. And while I found individual pieces of this book sharp and evocative and meditative, as a whole I thought that this book kind of lacked cohesion and didn't quite feel complete. And one of the biggest questions looming over this whole book is, why is Francisco Cantu working on the Border Patrol at all? He is the grandson of a Mexican immigrant and grew up near the border in Arizona, and then he left to study international relations at American University. And he justifies the choice to come back to Arizona and join the Border Patrol by saying that after years of studying and talking about the border, he wanted to really understand the reality of it and experience it for himself, which I understand to a point, but throughout the book you get the sense that he is very disturbed by what he sees as part of the Border Patrol and by some of the corruption and practices within the Border Patrol, and his mother is a recurring figure who serves as kind of the voice of reason and his external conscience throughout the book, and she tells him more than once that if you are part of a system for too long, you become that system. And for me, I never really understood why he stayed in the Border Patrol for as long as he did. So I just spent this whole book kind of wishing that I'd had a better sense of his own personal motivations and his place within the story. That being said, this book is beautifully written and the way that he writes about the border itself and the elusive and constructed and constantly shifting nature of the border is often quite moving and thought-provoking. And he raises important points about how border crackdowns have served to weaponize the landscape as they push migrants farther and farther into remote areas of the desert. And I found all of that really valuable and important to think about, but I just wish that this book as a whole had had a stronger sense of purpose, because as it is, it feels kind of like a first draft that really could have been fleshed out into something a little bit more probing and more substantial. And lastly, the best book I read this month was Like Eating a Stone, Surviving the Past in Bosnia by Polish journalist Wojciech Tokman. And this is a slim volume that chronicles the aftermath of the Bosnian War, which was a conflict that lasted from 1992 to 1995 and left over 100,000 people dead, many of them Bosnian Muslims who were the target of a Serbian ethnic cleansing campaign. And because of the way that ethnic cleansing was carried out, one of the greatest challenges Bosnia has faced in the post-war years has been the massive task of recovering and identifying the remains of thousands of people who went missing during the war and whose bodies were thrown into unmarked mass graves or scattered through the mountains and the forests or in some cases thrown down wells. And in spare but searing prose, Tokman follows widows in search of missing husbands, mothers whose only remaining wish is to find their children and give them a proper burial, and perhaps most memorably, he follows a Polish forensic anthropologist who has made it her life's mission to piece together the remains of the deceased and finally provide an answer for the people who have been left behind. And in the midst of all that, Tokman is also witness to the sort of uneasy peace that has settled over the former Yugoslavia, which is a region still deeply divided and reckoning with the brutal consequences of a war that really tested the limits of human cruelty. And this is a book that asks in quiet and indirect ways how a country can possibly return to normal life after a conflict that displaced thousands and that also saw ordinary citizens slaughtering their own neighbors. So this is a sobering but excellent book that I absolutely recommend if you're at all interested in the Bosnian War. Anyway, that's what I read this month. Now please enjoy some extremely amateur footage from my trip to Wyoming. <laughs>
So on the way to visit my friend Aaron in Cody, Wyoming, I stopped for a day in Grand Teton to hike around and bike a little bit. So here I am in Grand Teton National Park. It's an early Sunday morning. I'm hiking up to an overlook. So not many people out on the trail yet this morning. This was my first time hiking alone in grizzly bear country, and spoiler alert, I did not get eaten. I had a nice quiet morning hike up to a waterfall, and everything was so green, and the wildflowers were beautiful. And then I spent the afternoon biking around the park, which was awesome. Grand Teton is very bike friendly and it's one of the most beautiful national parks that I've been to. The mountains are just so dramatic and rise out of an otherwise flat landscape really suddenly and I just haven't really seen anything quite like it in America. Then I drove up through Yellowstone National Park and east to Cody, Wyoming, which is a city of about 10,000 people that was founded by William F. Cody, also known as Buffalo Bill. I visited the massive and really impressive Buffalo Bill Center of the West, which includes five different museums. I also went on a trolley tour of Cody, which was very interesting and informative. I also visited the local bookstore and did a little biking along the Shoshone River, which runs through Cody. On another day, Aaron and I hiked up Heart Mountain, which is a pretty striking mountain just north of Cody. And it was also the mountain that loomed over the Heart Mountain Japanese internment camp that was there during World War II. And it took us about five hours round trip to hike up and down the mountain, but it was just an incredible hike and we were so lucky because all the wildflowers were like popping out. We saw tons of Indian paintbrush and lupin and a bunch of other flowers that I can no longer identify. So it was just a great day. If you're ever in the area, it's absolutely worth the hike up. And at the end of the day, we saw some cows and some more antelope, and then we kind of just chilled by the Shoshone River, which was awesome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Smile, Hi. Aaron. And then the next day I went to visit Aaron at work at the Heart Mountain Interpretive Center, which is an excellent museum and memorial to the Japanese internment site that was located there and I really recommend visiting if you're ever in the area. And then we went to Yellowstone and saw a bear on our first morning there, so please excuse the sudden zoom on this video. Literally on our first morning, two big elk and then a grizzly bear walked through the edge of the campground, which was great because it was far enough away that we were safe, but also close enough to get a pretty good look. And then we spent a couple happy days hiking and driving around the park. We saw tons of bison and lakes and more wildflowers. If you ever go to Yellowstone and want to see literally hundreds of buffalo, I recommend driving through the Lamar Valley because there are just herds upon herds of them there. I think our favorite hike was probably a quick one up to Trout Lake where we saw actual trout swimming upstream thanks to the kid who pointed them out to us because I definitely thought they were just like red rocks. And if I learned anything, it's that Yellowstone is super weird. It's just like steam is coming out of the ground. Everything smells like sulfur and rotten eggs. There are these bubbling cauldrons of geothermal who knows what. And to top it all off, apparently Yellowstone is sitting on a massive volcano that's going to like explode one day and wipe out half the planet. I'm not a scientist, but someone told me that. But in the meantime, before that happens, I definitely recommend taking a trip because it is beautiful and I can't wait to go back. So there you have it. If you have read any of the books that I talked about or if you've been to Wyoming or Yellowstone or whatever, let me know what have you been up to this summer. I would love to hear from you and I promise to be back sooner than last time. Thanks so much for watching, guys. Bye.